Good morning, everybody. I am so glad to be in worship with you today. I'm Pastor Linda, and we have a wonderful day of worship, a time when we welcome the Gulf Coast Choir with us. Uh, you have a description in your bulletin about who they are and what they believe, but I want to tell you, this is a group of fun, wonderful people. They are just plain nice. So... <laughs> <laughs> they enjoy being together and singing together and just proclaiming Jesus by their actions and calls us to be one and I am so grateful they rehearse here every uh, Monday night and so I get to see them sometimes when I'm out walking my dog and uh, as they're getting ready to either go in or go out and they're just a fun group to be around. So we are so grateful that they're here today blessing us in our worship. They will be back on April 19th, 14th, I know, April 14th, and they will be given their concert. It's their fundraiser for the year. We will have information about tickets for that. I was here last year. You don't want to miss it. So um, put that, go ahead and just put it on your calendar in ink right now, April 14th. But welcome. We are so glad that each and every one of you is here today. And I'm glad you're here. If you're visiting with us, we're especially glad that you're here. And I welcome our friends at home that are watching online either this morning or during the week. We are so glad that you are here. We are all joined together by God's love. Amen? Amen. There's nothing better than worshiping together. Well, you have picked a good day to be here and worship, and I apologize for our online people because we have a strawberry festival going on this morning. We will eat some for you. I'll, uh, I'll, we'll do our duty to do double do so to take care of our friends at home. But um, our ladies have strawberry shortcake and sandwiches and wonderful things. So after worship, we invite you to go to Haley Hall and just be community and hang out together. Um, it's a wonderful time for just to to remember who we are as Christ's people and enjoy some good food. Um, also today, if you are able to, we invite you to donate blood, give the gift of life. I mean, there's nothing better than this body that Jesus has made, you know, and to be able to give the gift of life to somebody in need. Um, there's nothing else that you can blood we can't make it and we need it so um, I know there's a desperate need for blood right now and so the blood mobile is here so if you are able to give um, they will be here till one o'clock and we invite you to to sign up and and give the gift of life as well take a look at the announcements things going on we've got study groups things going on this Lent um, but it is just a joyful time to be in worship and to praise God Amen? Amen. Uh, I'm going to invite you to stand and let's join our voices together with them as we sing What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
Good morning. We are very happy to be here. We are the Gulf Coast Community Choir. We'd like to acknowledge our accompanist, Mrs. Holly DeWitt. I am Karen Chester Mango. I have the privilege of directing this wonderful group of singers. We are so delighted to be here this morning, and we want to say a special thank you to the Trinity family for always opening your doors for us for rehearsal and for the concert. Uh, you are one of the most wonderful group of, of people anywhere, and we do appreciate you and thank you for extending your hospitality to us each week.
my Jesus. Anybody here who loves the Lord? I want to know. I want to know. Church, is there any? Love my Jesus. Anybody here who loves the Lord? I want to know. I want to know if you love the Lord. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. Oh, is there anybody here? Love my Jesus. Anybody here? Love the Lord. I want to know. I want to know if you love the Lord. It's one grace that taught my heart to fear. Grace my fear relieved. How precious did that grace appear. The hour I first believed. Oh, is there any love by Jesus? Anybody here who loves the Lord? I want to know. I want to know. Love by Jesus, anybody here who loves the Lord, I want to know, I want to know, if you love the Lord, anybody here love my Jesus, anybody here love the Lord, I want to know, I want to know if you love the Lord. Oh, is there any? Anybody here? Love my Jesus. Anybody here? Love the Lord. I want to know. I want to know if you love the Lord. Oh, you feeling good? <laughs> feeling the joy of the Lord? Yeah. All right. Well, as we gather together to pray, whether we're at home or here in the sanctuary, we gather our hearts knowing that we are one, that God loves us and cares for us and calls us to be his people, to do a lot of work. There's a lot of work in front of us to do, amen? So as we gather in prayer, we remind ourselves that we need God. We can't do it alone. We can't do it without each other. And we join our hearts in prayer. Let us pray. Oh Lord, we thank you. Thank you, thank you for the joy of worship of being able to come together to leave all the busyness of our lives, the hectic pace, the chaos, and to come and focus on you right now, Lord, because you are what keeps us strong. You are our hope, the promise of salvation that is given to us. And in the season of Lent, we remind ourselves, Lord, of how frail we really are, how flawed we are, how many mistakes we make, Lord. Oh, gosh, we make so many mistakes, Lord. And we're reminded that we need you. 
So Lord, as we gather together in this time of prayer, fill us. Speak to us. You know what's on each of our hearts. You know the burdens that we carry right now. The fears, the anxieties, the loneliness, the grief. Oh Lord, speak to us, each one of us. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be upon us, will touch us, will bring healing, will bring wholeness, will bring redemption of all those times and places that we have let you down, have let other people down. Forgive us, Lord, and, and take away our shame and our guilt. Free us, Lord, to truly serve you and to serve your people. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will empower us. Empower us, Lord, to go forward and to, to be, go forward with purpose, as Jesus called us to do in serving one another, loving the Lord with our whole heart and loving our neighbor as ourselves. It's hard sometimes, Lord. We struggle. But empower us, Lord, to be your people, living your call in this world. Help us to make a difference in the name of Jesus Christ, to unite and not divide, to heal and not cause harm. Guide us, Lord. Guide each and every one of us. And as we gather today, Lord, to be renewed and refreshed, we pray that as we join our voices together to pray the prayer that Jesus taught us over 2,000 years ago, that we will be reminded of the call in each of our lives, what we are to do and how we are to live our lives. And so we pray your prayer, Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you so much to Karen and Holly and choir for just blessing our service today. A wise person told me a long time ago, always leave them wanting more. And so I hope you're wanting more and you've got that April 14th time circled in your calendar to come and get a full, a full dose of just joy and music. So we are just so thankful for all of you for being here today. Would you pray for me as I pray for you? Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful everywhere. Open our hearts and our minds to receive the particular message that you have for each of us today. And I pray, Lord, that the words I say are not my own, but are yours. Amen. Well, just to get us all a little caught, last week we started a sermon series that's called Living the Resurrection. And part of what we're looking at in this as we head toward the cross is looking at the people who were, who after the crucifixion saw the resurrection, saw Jesus in those first few days and were changed. And our, our, our sense is what, what can they teach us about how we can be changed in living that resurrection? And so th today, last week we looked at Mary Magdalene, and today we're looking at Simon Peter. So what do we know about Simon Peter? You know, I've got you, you got to think back now, go th do all your Bible studies. What do we know about Simon Peter? We know that he and his brother Andrew were one of the first called by Jesus. We know that they, their profession was fishing, right? And that they were pretty successful at it. They had a couple of boats and had employees. So they did a good job in their fishing. We know Simon Peter was married because in Matthew 8, Jesus came and healed his mother-in-law. That's all we know. We just know he was married. And we know that, that Simon Peter was part of the inner circle of Jesus. That when Jesus really wanted to go off by himself or talk things through, it was usually with Peter, James, and John, or that inner circle of people that he trusted to talk to. And we learned last week as we talked about Mary Magdalene that, that Peter was one of the first two to rush to the tomb to see that it was empty. Well, there's a couple other things that we know about Simon Peter that I, I, have, I have to tell you, I, I have grown to like Simon Peter. He wasn't my favorite for a long time, but I have really grown to like him. Because for me, he is a real person. In the Bible, he just, he shows it as it is, he tells it like it is, and he speaks it, and he lives it. We know that he was very impulsive. Anybody impulsive in here? <laughs> so, yeah, a few of us. So we know that when Jesus was walking on the water, who is the one to go and jump out of the boat to walk with him? Simon Peter. And we know because he says that he started walking and then he started thinking about what he had done. He's looking around him going, oh my gosh, what am I doing? And what happened? He started sinking. We know that that impulsive side is there. We also know he's very stubborn. In Acts... He dug in his heels to say that the, the Jews and the Gentiles were not the same, that they were different. And he fought Paul on that until God started going, Peter, Peter, started nudging him and had a dream. And then he, had, he saw God's people, the Gentiles, being filled with the Holy Spirit, just like the Jews. And, and this is what I do like about Peter, too. He admitted he was wrong. 
He said, I'm wrong. We are all, 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 all God's people. All God's people. So I've learned to like Simon Peter. He has grown on me. So what can we learn about Simon Peter when we're looking at how we are to live a resurrected life? What can we learn? Well, I'd like us, we're going to look at scripture from John 21, and I, there are two identities that Simon Peter has that I think can speak to us. Was we, oh, glasses would help. Ah. So we remember that Simon Peter, when Jesus was arrested, was very scared. But he was so close to, to Jesus, and he tried desperately to stay with Jesus during that time. He followed at a distance. We know he was in the courtyard where people were gathering outside of where Jesus was being tried. But he tried to be invisible. He was scared. All the disciples had sort of scattered. They were very frightened that people were going to want to arrest them too. But he wanted to be there for Jesus. And so he was there. But people started noticing him. Whoa, aren't you one of those Galileans? No, mm-mm, no, not me. Aren't you a follower of Jesus? No, mm-mm. And for the third time, you're one of Jesus' followers. And he swore, which meant he was adamant. It stomped his foot, no. I am not a follower of Jesus. And he ran off and left Jesus, his friend, alone. Can you imagine how he felt after that? How would you feel? The guilt, the shame. And so we pick up the story in John 21. And this is after the resurrection. Afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the Sea of Galilee. It happened this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, also known as Didymus, Nathaniel from Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples were together. I'm going to go out and fish, Simon Peter told them. And they said, we'll go with you. So they went out and got into the boat. But that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard him say it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the net full of fish, for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. Here we're learning about the identity of Peter. We know he fished for a living, right? And think about it, he's scared. Jesus, this man that he was followed for three years, how excited he was to leave his profession and to go and fish for men, fish for people who were lost 
and need it to know about Jesus, the hope of Jesus, all of a sudden, he was one of those people again. Lost. And so, what did he do? He needed to fish. He needed to go do something that he could do without thinking about it. That just was sort of refreshing, clearing his mind. He could do automatically. We all do that when we get in difficult times, when we don't want to think. What do you do? What do you do when you don't want to think anymore and you just need to, to veg? I am terrible. I get on my phone and play those games. I can kill hours playing games, but I'm not thinking about a thing. It is my veg time completely. But he needed to go and just get away, get back to something that was safe for him. The problem is, the problem is it didn't help too much. Because when you fish, if you fish, you know, it can be a little boring. It can be a little boring. I, f I grew up fishing with my dad. And so you like to catch fish because it gives you something to do and to think about. But when you're not catching fish, you've got a lot of time to think. And here Peter was trying, hoping to fish and catch lots of things so he wouldn't think. And he, all he could see was the empty nets in front of him, reminding him of his empty life now without Jesus. Lots of time to think. His escape was not helping him escape at all. Have you ever been at a point like that and you just need to escape from life? Maybe you were going forward and, and you're excited about what was in front of you and the door just slammed shut. And you're grieving, you're angry, you're frustrated. Maybe you're paralyzed to know what to do, how to go forward. And maybe we're like Peter, we go find something that, that used to work for us. Maybe it was fishing for you. Maybe it was music where you pick up an instrument that you used to play, haven't played for a while. That soothing practice. Maybe... Maybe, though, it's walking back into an addiction. That false sense of being in control that addictions give us. Maybe you like to cook, and so you start cooking everybody's favorite food because you need that affirmation from them of how wonderful it is, how wonderful you are. Maybe you start to hang out with old friends again that you know aren't really the best for you. They influence you in the wrong way. But maybe you just need to be distracted from the mess that you see in front of yourself. So here is Peter on the boat and he sees this man on the shore. He figures out it's Jesus. And suddenly that emptiness is gone. He's alive again. It's the Lord. And then the impulsive Peter runs it and he jumps over the board and ha swims to the shore, leaving his friends to haul in the fish and haul him to shore. But he's so eager to get to Jesus. so eager to get back to Jesus. And the scripture goes on to tell us that Jesus was there on shore and he'd prepared a fire on the shore, 
a charcoal fire, and he'd cooked breakfast for these guys that had been fishing all night. He'd cooked breakfast for them. Have you noticed that in, when Jesus makes appearances, resurrected, that food sometimes is involved? Do you think about that? He feeds his flock again, yes. feeds their souls. But he's also reassuring them, because you know what? Ghosts do not eat. And so if Jesus is there eating with them, he has to be alive. He has to be real. And so they meet, they eat, and everything goes well. And then we start to see a conversation that happens between Peter and Jesus. Let me read verses 15 through 17. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And Jesus said, take care of my sheep. The third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus had asked him three times, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all these things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. Feed my sheep. Jesus was asking Peter lawyer's questions. Do you know what a lawyer's question is? A good lawyer never asks a question that they don't already know the answer to. And so Jesus knew that Peter loved him, but he wanted him to say it. Remember the three times that denied. So we're sitting here, we're looking back, watching this happen, going, yeah, that's a great job. You're giving him three times to make up for what you did, Jesus, what he did before. That's a good, good job, Jesus. Right? That's what we're saying. This makes a lot of sense. Good job, Jesus. But I want you to see the story because the resurrection is more than just redemption. The resurrection is more than, than Peter, right at that point, being able to absolve his guilt and his shame. The re- he grant forgiveness. Jesus could have said, great, Peter, you're forgiven. So go out and don't do it again. That's not what Jesus said, did he? Jesus said, feed my sheep, tend my sheep, feed my flock, my lambs. Redemption is more than just that point. It takes us beyond. Because he gave gave Peter a new job. He started out being a fisherman, right? But what he's telling Jesus and um, Peter to do, feed my sheep, tend my flock, what are those the job descriptions of? A shepherd. And Jesus describes himself in the Bible as a shepherd who cares for his flock. He is now giving Peter his new job description. I want you to be my shepherd to care for the flock. He has given him purpose to go forward. He's given him direction. He's given him that push that he had lost. 
Peter is no longer Peter the fisherman, but he is now the shepherd of the flock. He is now the shepherd of the flock. He has a new job, a new purpose, and new direction. Jesus doesn't just redeem us. He makes us whole. He restores us. Let me say that again. Jesus doesn't just redeem us on the cross, but through his resurrection, he makes us whole. He restores us and gives us purpose to go forward. In my life before being a minister, I was a therapist, and I had a client, I'm going to call her Mary Beth, And she suffered for many, many years with an eating disorder called bulimia. We worked hard at it, uh, trying to overcome it. And she really, really had isolated herself from anybody. She didn't feel worthy. She was ashamed and guilt-read by what what she did. And in our therapy, we got her to a point where she was starting to be open to maybe reach out a little bit to people. And I sort of talked about, well, you know, what about church? You could sit in the back of church, maybe start out. Oh, no. No. Church is for those perfect good people. Right? Do we all fit that category? I couldn't go there. I don't belong there. God wouldn't want me there. We finally sort of got to the point where she was willing to try Celebrate uh, celebrate Recovery, which is a Christian 12-step program that includes some Christian worship in their program. And she said, I'll go sit in the back of that one. I said, okay. And after she did that, she came back. She said, this is amazing. There are people all around just like me. People who had made mistakes and did things wrong and felt shame and guilt. And yet they were joyful and they talked to each other and they liked each other. Wow. And... Jesus liked them. Maybe Jesus would like me. And she began to go and get involved in the recovery. And what she learned was, as she developed this relationship with Jesus, he redeemed her. And she began to have purpose in connecting to other people in the name of Jesus. And it gave her hope and purpose to go forward. Isn't that our story? Isn't that our story? That we are called to live the resurrection. And that means that that everything that we were, the guilt and the shame and all that we hold so tight, we can let go of. In the first service, people have asked about the cross. We're letting go of some of those shames and the guilts, and you see that hanging on the cross. And everything that we learn to do as resurrect people is based on the love of Jesus for us and then our love for Jesus and serving his purpose. It gives us life. It gives us hope. It gives us purpose. And going forward. That's what it means to live a resurrected life. That's what we learn from Peter. Is the redemption and the purpose that is ours. Is that something that you want and that you need? We're called to live that resurrected life.
I think all we can say with that is a big thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. Oh, gracious God, we are your people. We are flawed. We are we make mistakes, we have guilt, we have shame, Oh, but we love you, and we know that you love us. Help us to hold on to that love, Lord. Help us to, to grasp your purpose for us, for the wholeness that you call us to have, and to share the love of Jesus with others who, who don't see that they are worthy. Give us courage, Lord, to step forward in your name, to see the opportunities in front of us, and to step into them even when they make us uncomfortable. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for seeing us and all the possibilities that we have in bringing your kingdom here now for others. Amen. I invite you to stand as we close with our closing hymn, Down by the Cross.
I need a thank you, Jesus. Oh, that was sad. I need a thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping with us and blessing us, Karen and Holly and all of you. Thank you. Terry, as always. And I want to thank all of you. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Remember that we are people who are redeemed and called to purpose, okay? To find wholeness in that purpose. And so remember as you walk off of this campus, underneath the doors or over the doors, you're going to see going out into the mission field. What does that mean for each one of you? That's what I want you to think about this week. What does it mean for you? What is your mission field that God is calling you to live a resurrected life in? May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance and give you his peace. This day and forevermore and all God's people said,